Thank you for the great honor and privilege to be in your midst and to represent one of the best theologians from the Dutch tradition here in the United States of America. I'm back because I grew up as a boy in Clifton, New Jersey, but we w went back to the Netherlands. My dad was a pastor in the Free Reformed Church there when I was eight years old. And so the United States always feels like a second home country for me when I'm back. And it's great to be in your midst and to share some thoughts on Hermann Bavink and to try to answer the question why it is still important to study his theological work. The best way to answer this question, in my view, is just by sharing with you what I have learned from studying Hermann Bavink's theology. I will do so in five concentric circles with some nice quotations from Baving's work. Though these five points, not of Calvinism, but of Bavinkianism, if you would call it that way, are rather personal, I think that they will also draw a nice portrait of my famous predecessor in the chair of dogmatics at the Free University in Amsterdam. So it is a privilege, but it also feels like a high responsibility to represent him here in the United States. The five points that I will mention also have to do with some tensions that I discover in his theology. I don't believe that there are two Bavings, one orthodox and the other modern. No, there is only one Baving, basically. But he is a figure with contradictions and paradoxes and tensions in his theology. And I think that especially makes it so interesting to study him because we have to deal with similar tensions and paradoxes in our own days. So let me start with the smallest circle, which I would call the circle of Baving's spirituality, especially his quest for certainty, for assurance, the assurance of salvation, the small circle of the Christian's heart. And if I would say one thing about Baving's theology, it is that his theology is food for the soul of every Christian. Um, Bavink meant a lot for me when I started to study theology at the University of Leiden, which was closest by where I lived, my father being a pastor in a small pietistic congregation. I really wanted to be a pastor myself, but in this independent congregation, there was no seminary that we were officially affiliated with. So I just decided to study theology at one of the state universities in the Netherlands, where they also train the ministers for the Dutch Reformed Church. And finally, I became a minister in that Dutch Reformed, broad, mainstream church though connected to a reformed movement within that church. Anyway, when I studied in Leiden, there was a kind of tension between the way in which at home we would deal with Scripture as the Holy Word of God, infallible, with, with reverence and respect, and the strong, liberal, historical, critical, objective, method of religious science and religious biblical studies. That was the approach at Leiden University when I started to study there. So then you, yeah, it's, it's really difficult as a young student how to deal with that tension. But in fact, I was really, even that I didn't realize that at that time, following in the steps of Hermann Bavink, who also came from a secession church. His dad was a pastor. They had a seminary in Kampen, but he really wanted to seek the confrontation with modernity, with modern theology. That was exceptional in his days. Even one of the colleagues of Jan Bavink, his father, John, you would say, he said, what are you doing? You are throwing your son in the lion's den, the mouth of the lion. And then Father Bavink said, well, I trust that God is able to 
preserve him and take care of him even in that context. So we need the grace of God for that. I experienced that same tension between pietistic background, growing up with the existential question also of the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort both in life and death? that I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. But that also, that is something that you have to, um, that has to become personal in your own life, that, that it's something for the heart, that it is not, not something self-evident that is just given, but that it has to, uh, has to be experienced, maybe, even, as your personal comfort. Anyhow, when I was studying at Leiden, I ran into that beautiful pamphlet of Hermann Bavink titled The Certainty of Faith, written in 1901. And it really helped me to deal with that tension between modernity and the Christian tradition, even the pietistic Christian tradition. Bavink says, doubt has now become the sole sickness of our century. But it is not recognized as sickness anymore because it is declared as the normal state of the mind to doubt about the truth, to doubt about anything. But still there is a desire deep in the heart of anyone for truth and for certainty about the truth. And then he made this nice distinction between the certainty of faith and scientific certainty. Quote, faith cannot be undermined by scientific arguments, and it cannot be convincingly established by it either. It always rests on revelation. Scientific certainty rests on rational and therefore more universal grounds than the certainty of faith. But the latter far outstrips the first in its subjective power, that is, in the strength of the tie by which the soul embraces the object of its faith. Well, Bavink in that same booklet, The Certainty of Faith, also dealt with the more pietistic questions of personal assurance of salvation, brilliantly connecting these personal questions with a more objective question of the truth of Christianity, bridging the gap between faith and science by analyzing the grounds of science that ultimately also rest in God's general revelation and have to do a lot to do with trust. Trust in the sense perception, trust in generations that have gone before us. So he does distinguish the two from each other, but he also tries to connect the two with each other. And then at Leiden, I decided to write my master thesis that later became a part of my dissertation on Bavink's booklet, comparing it with the position of Benjamin B. Warfield, who wrote a critical review of the booklet, especially about the apologetics that he found a little bit insufficient. And then Bavink wrote a second edition of his booklet, responding in between the lines to Warfield's friendly criticism, as he said in the introduction to the second edition. Anyway, if we speak about the heart, this first tension in Bavink's theology, his relationship with his pietistic background, the influence of the reformed secessionist tradition combined with his love for culture, for modern culture. No, there are not two Bavings indeed, but there is this beautiful tension in his work. And he had a critical view of pietism if it would imply a withdrawal from culture and from the world. That is not the task of a Christian, just to survive and wait for a happy end. And still, he estimated in the pietistic tradition that 
sense of the necessity of true and pure faith. A quote from The Certainty of Faith to end with, this pietistic tradition overestimated and overemphasized the one thing needful. And that's, of course, a reference to Mary sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. But while these 19th century Christians forgot the world for themselves, we, as neo-Calvinists, run the danger of losing ourselves in the world. Nowadays, we are out to convert the whole world, to conquer all areas of life for Christ. You even hear, if you listen carefully, Abraham Kuyper, right? There's no square inch, or we say in Dutch, no thumb breadth, but you can translate it that way. But a square inch is like, well, it's a more technical thing. So there's no, no peace, no thumb breadth where of Christ doesn't put his finger on and say, that is mine. Yes, Bavink agrees with that, but he, and that's the last part of the quote, he also says, we often neglect to ask whether we ourselves are truly converted and whether we belong to Christ in life and death. And for no reason, Bavink would want to lose that pietistic heritage that he really cherished, notwithstanding the fact that he had a very broad view. This brings me to the second concentric circle, and that is the circle of his relationship with Reformed theology. Bavink is most well known, at least thus far, for his Reformed dogmatics and his Reformed ethics. In fact, his first theological publication after writing his dissertation was a sixth edition of the synopsis of purer theology. It was written in 1625 in Leiden, right after the Synod of Dort, and it shows that Reformed theology is much more than the five points of Calvinism. That's only one segment, really, the doctrine of grace, soteriology, but that Reformed theology is about the whole body of theology. In 52 disputations, we just edited the seventh edition with a group of scholars in the Netherlands with the bilingual edition in Latin and in English. Maybe some of you know the synopsis of pure theology. Well, it's an expensive book, but at least it's a very nice introduction to 17th century Reformed theology. While he was a pastor, Hermann Bavink was really versed in that tradition, writing this sixth edition only in Latin without a Dutch translation and uh, editing it. In a letter to his friend Christian Snoekhoor Gronje, a great Islamist in his days, Bavink reflects explicitly on the influence of the synopsis. Quote, Some time ago I accepted the responsibility for the sixth edition of the synopsis Purioris Theologiae of Wallaeus and his colleagues that was recently published by Donner. I did this to study Reformed theology a bit at the same time. I am better first in it now than before, and it has had quite an influence on my own theological perspective. In my view, a positive one. Perhaps you Snukor Kronje are of a different opinion because he was a Christian, but a very liberal Christian. Still, they kept up this lifelong relationship and friendship in their correspondence with each other. That's interesting. At least the synopsis and that, that, that being, that diving into Reformed Orthodox theology was very influential for Hermann Bavink. And in all the loci of the Reformed dogmatics, you can find a profound summary of the history of Christian doctrine. I think that makes Bavink so popular nowadays. It goes together with the revival of interest in Reformed orthodoxy and in the Reformed scholastic method. Think of the work of the great work of Richard A. Muller and others that 
reinterpret in a more positive way than previously the Reformed Orthodox tradition. But I think in Bavink you don't just have a copy of that tradition, but he really masters the tradition and is able to apply it to his own situation. For instance, let me give two examples, rejecting a mechanical view of inspiration that detaches the authors of scripture from their personalities and their historical contexts. Bathing advocates an organic view of inspiration. This means that the Holy Spirit leaves room for the human side, not only in the process of inspiration, but also in the remaining character of the text of Scripture. The whole Bible is the Word of God, and God breathed. But it is also vulnerable, and it is given to us in the vulnerable form the humble form, Bavink would say, of inscripturation. Just as the eternal word of God, the Son of God, took on the form of a servant, so also the written word of God has the form of a servant in the Bible, in Scripture. One other example is his it's profound analysis of the doctrine of providence, a doctrine that I'm working on with a few PhD students at the moment, by the way. And then he brilliantly, in my view, explains how that reformed position relates to chance, on the one hand, you're lucky or you're not, and fate or determinism, on the other hand. And then he discerns a pantheistic tendency in modern culture, in its identification of the world and God, going back to Baruch de Spinoza. And maybe the most well-known quote of Spinoza is, God or nature, that is, God is nature, the identification of Deus, Siva, Natura. If these, these two are both one in Spinoza's pantheistic thinking, that leaves no room for real human freedom. That's deterministic. But the same goes for naturalism, as Bavink would call it, or materialism, as he sometimes call it, calls it. And that's not being materialistic in the sense of having a lot of money, but that means that in the end, everything is only matter and energy, nothing else, nothing more. It's the same thing, flip side. Pantheism and atheism, or naturalism, really relate to each other because they are monistic in their views of reality. Should we then, on the other side, be dualistic? No, of course not. That's the other danger of not fate, determinism, pantheism, atheism, but the danger of chance, a deistic position, Bavink says. And you can see that within Christianity in several positions, Socinianism, and even the remonstrant or Arminian view, leaving just maybe a little room for human independent freedom to make your own choice separate from God's overall uh, guiding providence. That means a separation of God and the world. Maybe it's just for a very small part, but in essence, that deistic position leads to chance, to uncertainty. Where are we going? God leaves options open and doesn't really know or doesn't really control where you are going. You would see the same in our days in open theism, for instance. Anyhow, then he comes to the reform position and says, it's not the deterministic identification of God and the world. It's not the deistic separation of God and the world, but it's the relationship between our creator and his creation, especially the relationship with us as human beings made in the image and likeness of God. What a beautiful analysis of the reformed doctrine of providence.